All right, welcome back to the show, Make Them Famous, where we usually discuss how partner enablement works. But on this episode, I wanted to do something a little bit different. And the basis for this episode was a LinkedIn post from our friend, Will Taylor, over at Partner Hacker, where he begs the question to his audience, is it possible to grow your company with 100% partner-led approach? I answered it pretty top of mind in the comments, and I made a, a little bit of a prelude to an argument about, well, let's reframe the question and let's figure out what to focus on and what really partner-led and partnerships and partners are and what it means to the organization before we go ahead and answer it. I recorded a video, I created an article. You can read that here, I'll link to it in the notes. Uh, and I wanted to kind of uncover exactly what we could answer about this question that would be valuable. And then I decided, you know what, this needs to be a podcast. So I reached out to Will and said, can you join me? Jump on the podcast and uh, let's go ahead and answer it. So on this episode, we dive deep into the question, what are partners and who are your partners versus collaborators versus business development relationships versus just an integration that you have? And uh, what does a partnerships led approach really include and, and what does it mean for an organization? And can it stand alone to create a large organization or not? So let's find out what Will has to say. Welcome to Make Them Famous, the podcast about partner enablement. The only podcast to uncover both how partner teams enable their partners and how other department leaders enable their partner teams to achieve success. Well, we could not make this podcast famous without help from our sponsors. For sponsorship, we looked to platforms that help you find, activate, enable, and manage your partner program. These tools may be the only tools that you'll need to effectively run partnership. The tools in question are Reveal for account mapping and running co-selling operations and Partner Hub for working closely day-to-day -day with MSPs, managed service providers. When you're ready to really get into the revenue operation of partnerships, that means that you want to map accounts, see what the overlap is, see who I'm targeting that you're also targeting, see who I'm targeting that you're not targeting, and come up with a strategy to get those accounts into my pipeline, into your pipeline, and to build that pie, that bigger and bigger pie together. Oftentimes, you'll invite a partner to an account mapping solution that has a paywall too early, which is prohibitive for a lot of uh, the target audiences that our partner programs are after, the digital agencies. Uh, if you invite them to reveal, you can trust that they won't hit a paywall. There's 360 account mapping UI in reveal for free, and it is at reveal.co. Finally, Partner Hub, again, it's a partner operations platform. Partnerships has a lot going on. Who's doing what? at what stage in the partnership are the questions that many of my partner managers ask themselves. Partner Hub is here to solve for what are we doing with partnerships, who's doing what, where are our partners, and if we need to find more, are we able to go and shop for more partners? Partner Hub answers all of those questions with yes, and it is free. It's free for top tech companies like Apollo, AudioWise, Smith, Growbots, Recart, Customer.io, and it's free for digital agencies like Hawk Media, Trellis, Aptitude 8, Creative Trends. A lot of these tech companies and agencies use Partner Hub to find and align with each other. MSP, Managed Service Provider, Digital Agency, as well as SaaS tech companies. So check it out, partnerhub.app. And again, thank you for listening. I'll let you get back to the show. All right, Will, welcome to the show. To start, go ahead and give us the, who is Will Taylor? What are you up to right now? Thanks for having me. First of all, I'm excited to chat again with you. Um, it's been a bit since we have chatted. My name is Will Taylor. I'm the head of partnerships at Partner Hacker. 
If you don't know about Partner Hacker, we are a media company and we talk about all things partnerships. Uh, we run events, create compelling content, and start and continue discussions in the ecosystem. Um, I come from a background of doing sales and then getting into partnerships. And I did uh, partner enablement at Vidyard, then ran partnerships at Mailshake, a sales tech company, and then found my way to Partner Hacker. I'm a content creator by heart as well. And I think that's why the Partner Hacker team said we got to pick this guy up. And so, um, yeah, today I'm excited to talk about all things partner-led. Killer, killer. And if you're watching this on our channel or in the post, I'm going to share my screen and just uh, mention what brought this conversation together. It's this post fantastic content from Will Taylor. If you're not following him, definitely do that. And uh, he put out a poll asking really what type of strategy is most, I think you use the word, uh, most possible or approachable for creating a you know, the right type of company. It's sales-led, marketing, sales and marketing, I think, grouped together. Product-led is a buzzword that's been around for a little while now. And, um, and of course, partnerships-led or partner-led. And uh, of course, you know, our network, Will and I, probably a little biased to the partnership-led. So I do want to get an open discussion and talk a little bit about the definitions of a partner going into what really is partnerships led growth. What does it really mean? The different types that we want to discuss and then go into which is most economical or sustainable, which type of growth uh, lever would be the fastest to take off and which could create the largest organization if done exclusively. So we'll go into those talking points. But Let's let's set the groundwork here. Let's let's get some definitions underway. I think the word partner is getting thrown around and put into a lot of conversations where, you know, maybe it shouldn't or maybe it should, but you know, let's talk about what it is. What is what is a partner in your definition and what are the types yeah. that you like to talk about? So, I would define a partner as any individual or organization that you work with on business objectives on a regular basis. Um, that's how simply I can explain it because, you know, we'll get into some of the nuances, but the regular basis and running programs, I think, are important. If you just sign a piece of paper to say that your partners, doesn't mean much until you actually do something together. And if you just build an integration into another platform, that doesn't mean you're doing any programs. Uh, they may not even know who you are. So I wouldn't consider that a partnership either. So it's, again, any organization or individual that you are actively working with to meet business objectives uh, jointly together. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And we have a, a great thread of comments that we can pull from so we can mention some of these other um, awesome thought leaders that have some great experience and some thoughts on this topic. Um, okay, so first, uh, the partnership definition, everybody that's involved in this conversation probably have a little bit different lens there, depending on what types of partners you're dealing with. I typically deal with your MSP consultants, agency partners. Um, I work with the tech teams as well, but strategic alliances and technology partners um, can be involved in this approach. And then the solutions partners are what I'm most experienced with. Will, you've got experience on all sides, so you can talk to that as well. Uh, but partnerships led. So if we talk about the word partnerships led, what are some of the ways that you help teams understand what, what partnerships led really means? Yeah. So my definition of partnerships led is having this North star where everything you do within your business incorporates partners in some form. And of course, where appropriate, you know, HR, including them, there, probably not going to make sense. So the partnerships led motion is this North star that overlays across all other departments and what they're working towards, meaning it's baked into the goals that they have and the KPIs that they're working on. And, you know, the North Star itself won't actually, you know, paddle the boat. You obviously need to do sales in some form and marketing in some form. You can't just only have partners and then you're just working with them and they're doing everything for you. Um, that is perhaps a unicorn situation, but I would say the partnerships led focus and the way that we can think of this 
idea and this word is the North Star that all businesses should be working towards and an overlay across the business that all departments should be working towards as well. So if you're selling, you're selling with partners. If you're running any marketing program, it should at least consider and incorporate partners as much as possible. Uh, and then of course, product and the other initiatives as well should include partners again, where appropriate. So that's how I would define partnerships led. Um, and I, we'll get into you know how it compares or contrasts to the other blank led motions um, that are out there. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And uh, I started answering this question with just top of mind stuff. And then I kind of looked at it again and I was like, well, there's there's a deeper conversation that needs to be had. So I wanted Will to come on the, the show here and and talk towards it. And I think from a founder's perspective, building out SaaS, I I kind of look at this in a little bit different of light. I think there's partnerships as par for the course. And a good example of that is I'm building a SaaS company. I need to grow, period. In today's world, integrations are a necessary part of growth for any SaaS company. I think we can all agree on that. Your typical ecosystems that most SaaS will try to integrate with first are your HubSpot, Salesforce's, Slacks, SynGrids, AWS, et cetera, right? Um, or sorry, the AWS ecosystem, not AWS itself. But you, you have to build those connections in order to grow. So that's where the term par for the course comes in is it is table stakes, so that's where when I talk to partnership leaders and I see these posts going on on LinkedIn, I kind of feel like we're just cheerleading ourselves a little too much as partnerships people and giving ourselves a little too much credit for some of the things that are just par for the course. Um, so talk to me about your your opinions around you know where and when does a typical integration strategy become a partnerships led organizational strategy? Yeah, I would say, uh, number one, if you build 100 integrations and you do nothing with those other companies, those aren't partnerships. So if you call them partnerships, you shouldn't uh, because it is not a joint venture together. You're not doing something together. You're not working towards you know this joint value proposition. You're not co-selling, you're not co-marketing. And so if you build it, that doesn't make it a partnership. When you start engaging with these other businesses and you work towards a common goal or you know commonly work together to reach your own goals, then that's when you can start calling it a partnership because you're actually doing something. Um, you know, if you are married, then and you're not doing anything with your partner uh, in that sense, then you're you know, it's probably not going to turn out to be a good marriage and that might actually end. And, you know, you actually have to do stuff. You have to put in the work, you have to communicate, you have to, you know, have date night on Wednesdays, whatever it is. Uh, so that's where I think, you know, I've seen a lot of partner managers and partner leaders out there who enter into a company and they say, hey, we got all of these partners, you know, we're integrated with all these technologies. Now go make it work. Uh, but there's no relationship. Maybe they exchanged API docs and they may not even know who the current main contact is. Those are not partnerships. So wanted to make that very clear. Um, <clears throat> and I would say that like the what a lot of people need to make clear if they are talking about partnerships led is it's not the removal of selling. It's not the removal of marketing or you know building your own features. It's looking at what your objective is as a business, who you sell to, and then figuring out who you can engage with to enhance everything that you're doing already today. And a really good example is in the co-marketing space where, you know, if you're writing a blog post, why wouldn't you ever include the companies that you are running programs with, or, you know, if you want to start the relationship, those that you have integrations with, why not include links to their content or quotes from them where now you're starting to drum up the engagement where Maybe they distribute it for you. So you're getting more exposure. And so if you are a sales leader or a marketing leader, or you know even a founder, and you're trying to make all of this work, the idea here is when you include partners, you increase your efficiency and the actual outcomes that the programs you run uh, deliver. And of course, again, co-marketing, super easy example, twice the reach because you have two organizations distributing with you know less resources if you're both equally working on that project as well but regardless you know as you bring in more experts who are in the ecosystem that you serve 
uh, the less bias you'll have in your content and in the way that you sell and the more value you'll generate for those end buyers. So yeah, to sum that up, it's it's not the removal of any of these processes. It's working with these partners, running programs against it, because you're probably going to do these things anyways. So just include partners, and that's going to increase the overall efficiency. Oh, great, great, great stuff. Great stuff. Yes. Okay. So to summarize there, uh, we can't give partnerships credit for product par for the course stuff like integrations. It becomes partnerships when you proactively and routinely do stuff together, both of you committing time and resources to make whatever it is you did together, bigger, louder, more valuable for everybody, for both parties. I call it um, creating or baking a pie together instead of me wanting some of uh, Will's pie and Will wanting a piece of my pie. We, We get together and we say, what can we do to to build a new audience together that we can both uh, get value from. Okay, so um, a good anecdote to all of this, and this is kind of a little bit about me and where I came into partnerships and why I don't fully, to this day, understand it. I came into partnerships as a VP of marketing, but before that, I was in sales. And I did really well in sales because instead of just doing the one-to-one pounding the pavement, I would go to an organization, I would go to a uh, national organization, and I'd offer them a business development opportunity to include my product in everything that they do. Uh, in return, bring a whole bunch of stuff with that. And I, I, I quickly realized, okay, well, you know, the one-to-one approach, while it works, the one-to-many approach and the strategic approach is faster and better and easier. That business development transition into partnerships is is kind of where I entered it. And then I'd create these SaaS strategies, these go-to-market strategies for clients. And it wasn't called partnerships. It wasn't called channel. It was just your growth lever has to include those that are already doing great things in the market that you want to enter in. You know, your CEO may have experience and a brand and a name and thought leadership in that market. But most of most of the time, our SaaS, SaaS CEOs don't, and they can hire for this. But you need someone to create noise in that market, like reveal acquiring part of Partner Hacker, like uh, Airmeet hiring Nick Bennett. These people and these organizations, these businesses have thought leadership and brand exposure, and you can do it out of a purchase, or you can do it from a partnerships perspective and. Uh, creating things together and and being guilty by association. So I thought when I was just going to market with these SaaS companies, that was what you did. And I called it marketing. I called it growth. I called it sales and I called it business development. And then I found out about this word called channel and this word, the strategy called partnerships. And that's when I entered into this business. Um, But to that extent, let's get into kind of where this, where this all culminated and, what we can do to give some some value to those founders out there to say, yeah, okay, well, what is the actual strategy and what should I be thinking about and doing? So let's talk about uh, economies of scale and sustainability. So if you want to talk towards the other two strategies, you can. I can talk to those afterwards, but give me at least what is an economical and sustainable growth strategy for a new SaaS company and where do partnerships fit into that? Yeah, so um, with the nuance aside of you know the space you're selling to, or you know the price of your product, or how big the actual scope is, the way that I frame partnerships and that how founders can think of partnerships is it's the the long term play, and there's a reason why VCs are choosing to invest in what when they were investing and invest in partner led companies or you know part, companies that have a strong partnerships motion, even if they're growing at a slower rate, let's say two times, uh, and you know they have another option where it's growing at three times the rate, but it's a sales led company, and you know they have the typical sales structure of hire BDRs, have account executives, and do that more one-to-one. And the reason for that is because VCs across you know the thousands of companies that they've looked at, 
they found that the more successful businesses over time, you know, where the VCs get the return on their investment is the partner, uh, the strong partner partnering companies. And I don't want to completely say partner led because, you know, I would say this term hasn't been adopted widely. And so when we think about, you know, the economies of scale, when you have more nodes in a network that you can distribute the value that you bring to that network, then you're amplified by an amount that you can't even conceive of today. Where if you're thinking through the sales lens where it's one to one or the marketing lens where it's one to many, the partnering lens is many to many. And the analogy I like to to share with people, and I'll go through it quickly, is you know, the ecosystem is a forest and the businesses are the trees, and all of your buyers are congregating at these watering holes. You know, this is where they naturally congregate to. This is where they want to be. And if you are a tree or a business that's close to these watering holes and intertwining your roots with these other businesses versus being on the outskirts of the forest, when a tornado comes through and there's this economic downturn, then the businesses that are at the center and that have these interwoven roots, they are less likely to be uprooted. Whereas the ones that are on the edges, they get blown over and you know maybe they die, maybe they stand back up. And so when we think of economies of scale, as a founder, what I, er- I actually spoke to a founder two days ago and he's like, I don't know if I can do the sales led thing because you know, hiring BDRs, it's it costs the headcount and the scalability just isn't there. And it's also a sales tech that they were wanting to break into the sales tech space, which is really crowded. And so what I told them was, is I said, look at lavender.ai. They went full community, full partnerships. And you know, they do have s- some salespeople, but I don't think they invested, you know, the typical amount into these uh, hiring decisions because they knew that this space was crowded. And so how do you make noise? Well, you partner with the people that already have the audience, and then you also create this community or give to this community where you can continue to scale. So they have really good marketing now. When people go in to uh, buy their product, they either know who they are or they know someone who knows who they are. And when it comes to scaling your business, that is perhaps one of the most powerful things where you're tapping into this word of mouth that, like you mentioned, Alex, like you were working off of this natural thing that people were doing, these referrals, this word of mouth, like this has always happened. Partnerships is really just the operationalization and the strategizing of these relationships to run programs and then reach this scale. And so when I think of, you know, literally this is the advice I gave to a a founder was, you can still consider the sales approach, but also start to consider for the long term the community and the partnerships approach to continue to scale and have more nodes in the network that know who you are. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I got too, uh, too passionate there or went on a tangent, but um, I think that answers the question of the economies of scale, especially in this kind of market where, you know, resources are strained and the efficiencies that you gain from engaging with partners is, you know, like I I can't put a number to it uh, personally, but I know that you get more for less working with partners. I love it. I love it, man. Uh, Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think, I think it's, it's, it's really great that we are creating more strategic approaches to all the stuff that was kind of floating in between teams. I do, if I'm honest about partnerships and and where it's headed, I do think it's, it's, it's going to come full circle where an an org in the future is going to have go to market teams, not a sales team and a marketing team and a partnerships team, but a go to market team and people are going to have their roles and their, their reasons for being there and what they, they have to focus on. But I do see less about partnerships is siloed over here and sales is siloed over here and marketing is trying to kind of fit everything together. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that's, that's a different discussion altogether, but um, okay. So let's answer this question that you proposed um, in the terms of fastest as well as largest and most lucrative. Um, so let's talk first about product led and, um, since you just gave a lot of great information, I'll give you my short summary of product led, and then you can give me any feedback on that. And then we'll go into sales and marketing led, and then we'll end on partnerships led. Yep. So I got some good ideas. Yeah. So PLG, product led growth. Um, 
Again, I think this is one of those par for the course things. I think we call it product led growth, but really what that is, is, is making sure you're building product features that enable more referral and user acquisition strategies. Um, good product led growth strategies are uh, SaaS that are, will create sort of like a HubSpot creating an email signature product that's free for users that instantly puts them these these email signature signature generator users into their newsletter, which then um, obviously drips out some some product content and eventually captures them as a user. That's a good product led growth strategy. But again, I think this has to happen if you want to compete in today's SaaS. So building product integrations. Um, this is this is a strategy I believe will get you. Uh, easily to 10 million, like we've seen many SaaS companies, apps of Shopify, apps of HubSpot, 90% of these products will remain product-led growth as their only strategy. They'll create integrations, they'll build cool features, and then they'll get acquired and they'll never have a sales team, maybe have a marketing team and um, maybe dabble in partnerships, but probably not. And then if they want to go to 100 million, that's where we start talking about, okay, well, you're going to need a sales and marketing led approach in that world in order to get to that hundred million and then on from there. But what is your opinion on product led growth and some of the, some of the things that I mentioned there? Yeah. So I have two perspectives here. Um, the one is if I had all the money in the world to burn on a business or, you know, spend on a business, I would invest in a sales led strategy. There's a reason why it worked. It's like easy to reproduce. And, you know, if we're talking fastest growth, uh, even the example I gave where the VC is choosing, you know, the 2x growth partner focus versus 3x growth sales focus, it, it does work, you know, if you have the capital for it. But most businesses don't want to either burn that cash, especially in today's climate, or they simply don't even have that cash where, you know, maybe they're bootstrapped, they don't have the funding. And so that's where I think the product led growth uh, motion would come through and it's efficient. And the reason for that is because you create a good product, people talk about it, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, and then you grow in your user base and, you know, that's fine for, if you want to remain, like you mentioned, under 10 million or, you know, at that 10 million mark. But if you wanted to grow further, then you'd need to start considering other um, ways of growth. Now, my perspective here is like, if I was starting a business today, I would go product led. Now that would be in the background where, you know, the product can sell itself, which is the general idea of product led growth. And in the background, what I would be doing is I would be hiring people to expand our reach through partnerships. Um, it wouldn't be a full-on partnering motion because we, you know, a, as a small company, we wouldn't have too many salespeople. We wouldn't have, you know, too many resources for marketing. We'd have some, um, but instead of hiring, you know, that BDR to then go out, develop opportunities and try, you know, if it's free to paid, maybe try and work that motion or, you know, I get an account executive, they have some relationships and they can do one-to-one -one. that growth would be okay. But Honestly, I would rather invest in headcount that would be, you know, an evangelist in a market that can talk about, you know, my product and the problems that we solve, um, because I feel that that would then grow the company to that 10 million at a faster rate. But then also because I'd have these robust relationships already built up until that 10 million point, then I could tap into those relationships and say, okay, we're really getting this motion going. We want to go past 10 million and reach that hundred million mark. We'll start to hire a few more salespeople. But when we do that, we're going to already have these strategic relationships that are going to accelerate every other dollar that we put into sales and marketing at so much of a faster rate that um, I wouldn't have been able to achieve without that initial growth through the community and developing those relationships. So th those are my perspectives where Again, the, I'm not saying that sales or marketing led or you know per, uh, product led is not the way to go. Uh, there's definitely a time and a place, but this is where I, I feel that it should be that north star, where regardless of what stage you're at, that should be in the back of your mind as a founder to really start developing those strategic relationships because they compound over time. And maybe it's not the dominant strategy to start, 
But once you start to reach that scale, that's when you're going to say, oh, wow, I really wish I had more strategic relationships. And instead of backpedaling and trying to make them, then you already have those relationships and you can grow. And again, Lavender is a really good example of that. I'm a Lavender fanboy, as you can tell. Uh, I don't even use their tool too much, but it's it's uh, just such a good strategy that they have because they seem so big. Uh, and I I don't want to speak for them, but it seems like they've gone product leg led, but they seem so big, but they're only a team of, you know, they started at three and they were, you know, dominating the space. Now they're, I think, maybe eight to 10 employees and they're only growing further and they're investing in this ecosystem community approach that is all about engaging with partners. So th- that's my perspective of if I was a business, what would I do? Killer. Yeah, Lavender is a unique one because they launched with services, then they're building product around the use cases of the service uh, foundation that they build. What they did really well, like you mentioned, is community and building that community of sales leaders while they were rolling out services. And maybe the Wills had that community before. I don't know what they did before Lavender, but but yeah, that's a, that's a definite interesting approach too. very analogous to what we did at partner programs where we built services, launched those to enable us to attract community members. It's all a big flywheel where our service arm and our events arm brings in the community members. They all get housed in a uh, one of two communities. And then we just keep bringing more value and, and, and that brings more community members. So very interesting. That would, I would say, bucket under the marketing and sales call it marketing sales and maybe services and anything underneath that. Um, when you're past the product led growth, now you're talking about needing to get to a hundred million. Uh, typically uh, what will happen is uh, you'll start to hire marketing product, marketing and sales, and your, your VCs will be putting a lot of pressure on you to get to that hundred million and maybe you just closed around and um, things are moving really quickly and you, you're under a lot of pressure. And the only, not viable, but the only realistic answer that you can give your team and your VCs is bring in a sales team and ramp up marketing. That's really it. You can't. And to this day, I would say, and I'd love your argument on this, Will, you can't come to a VC group with a partnership strategy that will get you to 100 million. <laughs> without sales and marketing. I I would love it if you could, but I, I've i seen a bunch and I would say they enable and they quicken and they create sustainability and foundation. But what they do not do is sell a group of VCs that you're going to use a partnerships only strategy to get from 10 million to 100 million. I don't think they do that. Uh, Gong is a perfect example of this. I was actually pushing Gong's team to kind of do this channel strategy last year and even into the year before. And I was just getting doors in my face like, no, we are sales led. We don't do partnerships in that sense, meaning solutions providers. They, of course, had integrations. They did stuff with integrations partners. But then they launched their channel program, I believe, last year. They are at 100 million plus right now, or they were at 100 million in 2020 when they started to put together their channel program. And that's where I say, okay, well, now we're into the conversation of which which strategy, marketing-led and sales-led, product-led or partnerships-led, could create the largest organization if done exclusively, and that's where it becomes difficult. So Will, mm-hmm. if gun to your head, someone came to you and said, here is 10 million bucks. We need you to build something huge with this 10 million bucks. You can pick one strategy. <laughs> what would you pick? Uh, you know? do, are we assuming that there's unlimited time or... So that's what I didn't factor in time. I'll give you my factors and this will this will help you form your question. Yep. Think about that for a sec. So I didn't factor in time frame. Um, this is related to SaaS only. So if you're talking about other categories and verticals, forget that, just SaaS. Um, remove integrations from this conversation. Just assume again, that's par for the course. So we're talking about working together with these companies, actual partnerships, like you mentioned. 
Um, I also didn't include cloud marketplaces. So getting listings in G2 crowd, you're not a partner of G2 crowd. If, if AWS lists you in their app marketplace, you're not a partner of AWS. That's just par for the course again. And lastly, affiliate marketing. I kind of bucket affiliate marketing under marketing. Uh, it is a link and marketing and uh, that type of a strategy. So forget about those three. B2B SaaS uh, building solutions, partnerships, co-selling, co-marketing, bringing everyone together, not having a sales team. If you choose this route and everything is partnerships related, you can sell with your partners, but that is uh, called a partner development rep or something like that. And uh, then you have your partner en enablement managers, your partner marketing managers, all the content you put out as partnerships related, or you go traditional, you have a sales team, you have a marketing team and you have those initiatives or you forget about sales and marketing and partnerships and you focus on product led. Right. Which would create so, organization. Yeah. And the exclusively part I think is uh, a challenge. Cause like in my mind, I'm like, well, I would do a majority partnership focus, but I would, you know, need some salespeople even just to start. So um, I would, I would venture to say that if time isn't necessarily a factor, then the partnerships led approach would create the largest organization. Now that is over a long period of time. It wouldn't be the quickest because we talked about, you know, what would be, what would be the fastest and I, I will stand by like a sales led strategy is the, the fastest when you have the capital for it. Um, but in terms of the largest, we all, we have to think of, when we think large, it's not only just the customers that you have, it's the impression that you have in the market and how much market share you have, even if people are just engaging with your content. And so I would say that's not just a marketing function, that is a partnering function. Um, so I would say that the partnership-led strategy would still create the largest org if done exclusively because of the spreading of the message and the value that your company would bring um, and it would have to be, it would be a lot of work for, I'm thinking like if there's no salesperson, it would be a lot of work for the you know founder and the partner team. But again, assuming that there's uh, enough time, then it would become the largest organization. Because if we think about, I have, I have one caveat, um, or rather one uh, piece of information that's relevant to this. The Gartner did a study and they pulled the buying market, how they like to engage with sellers. And more than 70% of people reported that they don't want to engage with a salesperson. But that same 70%, uh, above 70%, said that they do want to engage with a human. And so what does that mean? Well, they don't want to be sold to. They want to be helped. And who can help your clients? It's your partners, because that's who your clients trust. They trust the influencers. They trust the communities. They trust the um, you know, the service providers, they trust the other technologies that you're actively running programs with, and you're getting this exposure through. They don't trust you as this new business. They're, they have their guards up to being sold to. And so that piece of information is, is highly relevant. And I would say, if you asked me this same question three or four years ago, I would probably say, well, let's say four years ago, I would probably say, go sales led. That'll create the, the largest because, you know, back then, I don't want to say it was, you know, too, too short ago, but it was back then people were used to that motion. They were used to being sold to, but now with COVID and just everything in the economic climate and this online world and the development of communities wanting to be having more togetherness, um, that I think has led buyers to be even further away from wanting to be sold to, to, I want to trust the person that, you know, is giving me this information. So that is the, the piece of information that I was on the the fence of what would create the largest org, but the fact that people don't want to be sold to or even marketed to, you know, I, I hate receiving ads. I skip all of them. And so like, if I don't want to be marketed to, I don't want to be sold to, I, how am I going to buy? Well, I'm going to buy through those that I trust. And that's again, going to be your partner. So uh, again, I was on the fence, but those pieces of information pushed me over where I would say this is how you create the largest organization if done exclusively is through partners. Oh, I love it. And yeah, you hit the nail on the head. 
And it's if you're reading the article now, it's at the bottom of the article. It's the word largest doesn't mean revenue and employees. You can have an extremely large organization making the most impact um, in a vertical uh, going exclusively with partnerships. Whereas if you are exclusively sales and marketing, uh, you are focused on margins and growth in uh, on the sales channel side of things, which means obviously revenue, which means you got to probably employ one person for every incremental growth in revenue. Whereas if you're partnerships led uh, companies, we mentioned Lavender, um, also thinking about um, pavilion, you know, these, these organizations that are massive in their world. And there's probably, I don't know how many employees are at Lavender, but you know, 40 or something, maybe 20, I don't know, but they're small relatively, but they create this huge impact. Now, what I like the idea of partnerships led is taking, uh, I still, I'd still consider sort of the community and the pavilion approach to an organization, a partnerships led approach. Um, because of, of everything they rely on their partners to do those hosting of the events, the, in, the, um, distri- distribution of their content and recording and being a part of all that stuff. That's all partnerships led. And then you can look at it like your end goal, may be a SaaS company you don't have to start a SaaS company to start a SaaS company. You can start a partner hacker. Partner hacker could roll out a PRM next month, and all of a sudden they've got a built-in audience and a and a followers, and and they could scale that super quickly without having to go and ramp up sales efforts because everybody's already coming to them for whatever they're providing. So I do like the idea of kind of looking at it through a different lens. If you're trying to create the largest organization with the most impact with an exclusive strategy partnerships led, I think we both agree, is uh, the best, most efficient way to do that. Um, But you're right. I think the main thing is it's going to include a combination of three. But to answer the question that you proposed on LinkedIn, I think we did it. You can do it if you do partnerships led. If you do product led, you'll have a great 10 million ARR business and you'll have a great exit. Your investors will be happy. If you go sales and marketing led, it'll take you longer. You'll have to raise another couple rounds. You'll get to that hundred million and uh, have a good exit, and everybody will be happy. It'll take a while and it'll take a lot of grit. But if you do partnerships led, I think you have a lot of sort of parachutes floating around out there, and you've got a lot of opportunities and options. You can be flexible. You can mess up on the product and still be able to survive. So, I think we're we're in agreement there. Uh, cool. Any final thoughts on teams exploring the when and how and what of partnerships led growth? Um, <clears throat> yeah, two thoughts is one, you should still hire, you know, sales and marketing people. Uh, it's not to say that you don't need them. You do need them because, you know, things need to be done in, in those regards. Um, and you learn a lot through those roles in terms of what your joint value is, or rather what your value is for the market and what's working, what's not. So those conversations are, are really important. That works really important. Um, and the second thing is like, if you're a founder and you're listening to this or a partner person or a salesperson, marketer, et cetera, it's, not to say that you need to drop everything and you know go find a bunch of partners and then figure it out. Uh, it is the things you're already doing. Think about how can I include partners in this? Uh, because you know if you're running a webinar, why not bring in three of your partners or potential partners and then get more exposure, more support, and have killer content versus marketing to your same customer list that you know is. Mar- webinared out from uh, all of your content and it brings something interesting to them. If you're a salesperson, think about how you can bring in an expert. You know, are you working with influencers? Are you working with consultants? Are you working with other technologies where you can get really focused in where you should actually send your cold calls or send your cold emails and maybe make them a little bit less cold with partners? So again, to summarize that, it's if you're thinking, okay, this all sounds great, what do I do? The first step is whenever you're going to run a program across any part of the business, think, how can I include partners? Uh, it's not 
terribly complex. Um, you can get into the weeds, but just think, where can I include more partners? And then you'll start to see those efficiencies and that scale. Love it. Uh, now we just got to figure out what we're going to title this thing and, uh, and some other little factors there. But I think we got the main gist of it. Uh, just to recap, define your partnerships, uh, define who is actually a partner and what it takes to make them a partner. Um, don't be lazy about this and just bucket all your integrations as partners and all your co-marketing um, collaborators. I call them collaborators. They become a partner when it's starts to become a routine and reciprocal. Um, the three ways to grow the company probably need a healthy mix of all three. Uh, but if you are going the community first approach, uh, services first approach to build your SaaS company later, a partnerships only is, is completely viable. And then if you are interested in sustainable, scalable, um, creating that moat, at some point, partnerships are going to have to be a part of that. And then as a culture, as a team, you just have to make sure everybody, all departments are on the same page with when does it make that transition from a business development conversation to a quote unquote partnerships routine? Same thing on the marketing side. Um, who do we involve in what and how do we turn those involvements, those collaborations into partnerships and pour gas on it, make it a repeatable strategy. Will Taylor, everybody, thank you so much for the time. Will reach out to you, LinkedIn. Yep, LinkedIn. I'm super accessible. I give my time, uh, no charge to everyone who asks uh, as much as I can. I have office hours. If you're thinking, how can I start? Like I mentioned in this, I spoke to a founder two days ago. It's something I do very often. So if you need help, reach out. And then of course, check out Partner Hacker because we are putting out really interesting and compelling content. Yeah. Shout out to Aaron over there. who's probably going to put some content on this topic together soon if he hasn't already. So look out for that. I'll link to it if um, it's out before we publish this and um, go and, and follow Will. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.